Good afternoon. My name is Christian Davies. I'm the Gene Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. And I'd like to welcome you to Art Bite today with Dr. Ruthie Meadows for Sounding the Visual, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Early Hip Hop. There are currently four works by Jean-Michel Basquiat on view at the Nevada Museum of Art as part of the World Stage Contemporary Art from the collection of Jordan D. Schnitzer and his Family Foundation, which is curated by our very own Joanne Northrup. The Art Bite Lecture Series is supported by the Nevada Humanities with additional sponsorship uh, with free admission for students sponsored by the Core Humanities Program at the University of Nevada, Reno. We thank them for their support and helping make this possible today. Um, a couple of bits of housekeeping, which I've kind of already gone over, which is you're not gonna be able to audibly ask questions. So please use the Q&A feature, which is you're gonna find at the bottom of your screen with the two chat bubbles to queue up any questions for Dr. Meadows. And after following her presentation, we'll have a Q&A period. Um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Ruthie Meadows. Uh, Dr. Meadows is an assistant professor of ethnomusicology at the University of Nevada, Reno. Her research focuses on poetics and orality in the Hispanophone and Circum-Caribbean, uh, including Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and New Orleans. Previous studies include an examination of the interplay between new media and queer politics in Dominican literature and popular music. In 2014, she published a histography of the audibility and visual, uh, visuality of Afro-Caribbean vernacular practices in New Orleans, including second line parades, social aid, and pleasure clubs of the Mardi Gras Indians, as central to the confection of a sense of uniqueness to tourist production, desire, and consumption, uh, which was included in the book, Sun, Sea, and Sound, Music and Tourism in the Circum-Caribbean, published by the Oxford University Press. Dr. Meadows, are you there, Ruthie? Yes, here we are. Hi, how are you doing this morning? Great, how are you guys? Doing pretty fantastic here in Reno. Um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and uh, we'll, we'll be back for a Q&A after your talk. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Ruthie Meadows. I'm an assistant professor of ethnomusicology at the University of Nevada, Reno. And I also teach classes on pop and global pop and world music at UNR. I'm very excited here to talk about Jean-Michel Basquiat and early hip hop. So I'm gonna kick things off by playing a track from 1983. This is called Beat Bop. It's a 12 inch hip hop single that was produced by Jean-Michel Basquiat in 83 and in which he did the cover art. Get funky in the place. Get funky in the place. This pathetic dope addicts have to be abused. It's the same what a thing to be a prostitute. Life is given to us just to do the right thing. Instead of that, we came a whole wall with big dope feet. Make you feel real bad every time I see another bump. Oh, brother sleeping on the street. In the corner, in the morning, every night and day. It's a pity, so invented. People try to act gay. Everybody's turning crazy, so you better believe to do the right things. All soon you'll see. Life ain't no more joke. It's a serious when you're dealing with the answer that we can't explain New York City is a place of mysteries Drug addicts, dope dealers, taking over the street That man's is always saying, why the hell do we pay for what? For they break All right, to get this in our ears. John michel Basquiat is an enigmatic American icon. His visual art is instantly recognizable, idiosyncratic, fiercely critical, and astoundingly powerful. The beat bop that we just listened to definitely has hallmark features of early hip hop, but it's also deeply experimental, like Basquiat's work himself. Although beat bop may have been Basquiat's only direct foray into hip hop music production, Basquiat's visual art emerges from and remained deeply embedded in early hip hop culture. Like a DJ, Basquiat recombines recognizable objects, words, and symbols to create new emotionally wrenching imagery. His images draw generative force from the resonance of repurposed symbols and text. His images are also subversive and they're revisionist. Like the MCs of early hip hop, Basquiat delighted in exploiting the distance between the literal and the figurative. His paintings evoke the dark, historically rooted underbellies of words. Through the sonic techniques of hip hop, Basquiat offers powerful critiques of colonialism, capitalism, and racism in the United States and beyond. In this talk, I encourage us to imagine the sonic environments of visual art. 
In other words, the larger soundscape in which art emerges. How might we not only see, but also hear the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat? How might we hear from our contemporary stance the sonic environments in which Basquiat created? How might we listen for the revolutionary new technologies and techniques of hip hop and see them transmuted into paint and ink? In this talk, I'll explore the ways in which the visuality of Basquiat used and referenced emergent sonic techniques in hip hop and DJ culture as they arose in New York in the 1970s and 1980s. Before we dive into sound and paint, I'd like to speak to the potential limits of hearing and seeing Basquiat as well, based on who we are. This June, a 22-year-old Dominican-American music journalist from the Bronx released a free digital archive called the Black Music History Library that's really, really incredible. And this was in response to an Instagram post that she created that essentially uh, traced the Black origins of a lot of different musical styles, not only musical styles that we think of as being racially coded as Black, such as hip hop or funk, but rather a wide variety of, of styles in the United States and throughout the Americas that have been sort of recoded as white, such as classical and country, et cetera. And she, she posted some really wonderful questions talking about the things that she asked herself whenever she consumes music that I think are very relevant to consuming not only music, but also visual art and Basquiat's art in particular here. She said, something that my work as a music journalist has taught me is to always ask questions about the music I'm consuming rather than being an idle listener. These questions can look like these and more. What's the story behind the music? What's the artist's identity? How does that inform their music? Why th what might this music mean to its intended audience? What does it mean to me? And if it means something else, why is that? Scholars of color have long acknowledged that the force of Basquiat's work was, and is often lost on its own collectors, especially white collectors who have coveted his pieces since the height of, of his lived popularity in the 1980s. Basquiat is a Black American icon, one who spectacularly navigated the white-dominated art world of the 1980s. He was friends with Andy Warhol, very famously did collaborations with Andy Warhol, was also friends with Deborah Harry, Keith Haring, and he ultimately, or this, this sort of imprecation in the white art world, ultimately led to his own um, detriment he became addicted to heroin at the height of his fame and overdosed at the age of 27. The art critic and current director of the Perez Art Museum in Miami, Franklin Sermons, has written a really, really wonderful piece on hip hop and Basquiat. And he says, quote, not your head to vist, no artist has ever so profoundly embodied a cultural movement as Jean-Michel Basquiat personified hip hop, hip -hop culture in its brilliant infancy, of course, before the term was ever coined. If you know what I mean by hip hop, then you probably don't own one of Basquiat's paintings, but you may feel them in a way that their owners may not." End quote. Kelly Jones, the art historian and daughter of poet Hetty Jones and the writer of Mary Baraka, also notes that Basquiat's mischievous complex and neologistic side with regard to the fashioning of modernity and the influence of it and effluence of black culture is often lost in translation. Fab Five Freddy, who is pictured here on the left, he was a filmmaker, a graffiti writer, a music producer, and a very close friend of Basquiat's, also said in an interview with Bell Hooks in 1992 that in order to see Basquiat, the established white art world must first, quote, look at themselves. He says, they have to try to erase, if possible, all the racism from their hearts and minds. And then when they look at the paintings, they can see the art, end quote. I bring this up all to ask, how can we open our eyes and ears to Basquiat based on who we are? What forms of inner work are required to do this? And while these questions speak to limits, they also speak to possibilities, possibilities for hearing and seeing otherwise. There are so many fascinating parallels for me between early hip hop culture and Basquiat. Basquiat's meteoric rise to global fame in the late 1970s and early 1980s definitely parallels that of hip hop itself. Both Basquiat and hip hop were revolutions. Basquiat in the art world and hip hop in the technologies and expressive possibilities of global culture and sound. Both were also born in New York through the creative interventions of black and Caribbean descendant youth. Basquiat was born in 1960 in Brooklyn, 
He was a first generation youth to a Haitian father, Gerard, and a mother, Mathilde, of Puerto Rican descent. As a child, he spoke fluent English, Spanish, and French, reading widely in each, and spent part of his youth in Puerto Rico in addition to New York. As an adult, he incorporated multilingual and Afro-Caribbean references in his art. He embedded Spanish language word images into paintings, as well as symbols and images inspired by Haitian voodoo, such as the loa or spirits gede and eshu. As a teenager, Jean-Michel Basquiat first gained notoriety as a graffiti writer, tagging the streets of the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the late 1970s. And he wasn't a sort of straight tagger. He didn't just put his name. Rather, he put these poetic sort of pungent phrases under the moniker Samo, which was short for same old or same old shit when he was just 16 or 17 years old. This was precisely the time when graffiti was converging with other elements of hip hop, um, rap, break dancing, and DJing in New York to define early hip hop culture. It may seem like an inevitability now, given hip hop's reach globally and in the United States, but hip hop, hip -hop was in many ways a localized and even potentially provincial phenomenon that reached global proportions through the efforts of women and men, such as guitarist and music producer Sylvia Robinson and Five, Fab Five Freddy himself, Basquiat's good friend. Sylvia Robinson's crossover recording of Sugar, Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight introduced rap to wider audiences in the late 1970s and Fab Five Freddy's participation in the film Wild Style in 1983 brought graf graffiti, breakdancing, and the sounds of hip hop music to wider audiences. In tandem with hip hop's rise, Basquiat himself would catapult in just a decade from local notoriety as a graffiti writer and occasionally homeless youth to an internationally renowned visual artist and rich, famous American icon. So let's dig into sound here. In the late 1970s, hip hop sounded something like this. To the boogity bang bang, the boogie to the boogie to be. Now, what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to move your feet. You see, I am Wonder Mike, and I like to say hello. Up to the black, to the white, the red, and the brown, the purple, and yellow. But first, I gotta bang bang, the boogie to the boogie, say up, jump the boogie to the bang bang, boogie, let's rock. You don't stop, rock the rhythm that'll make your body rock. Well, so far you've heard my... This song, like a lot of early hip hop songs from the late 1970s and the early 1980s, drew really heavily upon sampling, which is this sort of stripping songs to the raw materials and then repurposing them anew. And in this case, Rapper's Delight actually samples a song that came out the very same year. And this is very common that, that rap songs and early hip hop songs would actually reference songs that were still popular, that people were still dancing to in nightclubs. In this case, this song samples Sheik's Good Times, which was a, a disco band from the 1970s as well. I'll play the original Good Times here so that we can kind of reference the ways in which the sounds of this disco record were being repurposed in Rapper's Delight. Here's Good Times by Sheik. <laughs> Let's replay Rapper's Delight and I'll play it a little bit further into the song here. Your feet. You see, I am Wonder Mike and I like to say hello. 
I'm to the black, to the white, the red and the brown, the purple and yellow. But first, I gotta bang, bang, the boogie to the boogie. Say up, jump, the boogie to the bang, bang, boogie. Let's rock. You don't stop, rock the rhythm that'll make your body rock. Well, so far you've heard my voice, but I brought two friends along. And next up. So what this song does and what you can hear is that it really creatively uses new studio techniques and new turntable techniques that were emerging in the 1970s, not only in New York, but in other places throughout the Caribbean, throughout the Black Atlantic, and taking things like bass lines, break beats, vocal lines, et cetera, and repurposing them in really, really creative ways using different filters and other sort of new technologies of hip hop and turntablism to create these new songs. And again, hip hop definitely emerged not only in New York, but in, in conversation with a lot of other DJ and turntable cultures that were emerging in other sites throughout the Americas. For example, Jamaica, Columbia, house music in Chicago, et cetera. And in a lot of ways, turntablism and hip hop and DJ culture were revolutions. DJ literally took a turntable, which was a playback device, and made it into an instrument. DJs use the turntable as a tool of disassembly and recomposition. We can hear this in the Chic example and then the way that it's repurposed in Rapper's Delight. DJs strip previously recorded records to their raw materials called samples and then repurpose those samples in new ways. And a lot of these sonic techniques that emerge in hip hop, I think that we can find parallels in the visual art of Basquiat, which I'll be going through in just a minute. But definitely in terms of, of scratching, literally scratching records back and forth to create these sort of rhythmic sounds, rapid repeats of segments, remixing and also mixing sounds from the past in new ways. In the case of Chic and Rapper's Delight, it's a song again that was, that was still popular at the exact same time that the new song was released. The use of filters, in this example, we hear a lot of echo and in other hip hop songs from the early 80s, we hear uh, delay and reverb as well. And there's really fascinating ways of reference and self-reference that we'll get to in a minute that emerge in hip hop and which I think find parallels in Basquiat's art as well. In terms of the technologies that were emerging in the late 70s and 80s in New York, not only the turntables sort of repurposing as this new instrument. There were also other kind of technologies that were emerging at this time, such as synthesizers and drum machines that enter really heavily into early hip hop. We can definitely hear this in the first example of beat bop from 1983. What's fascinating about the Roland drum machine is that it was essentially a flop in terms of the market. It was released as a uh, a drum machine, but also sort of a practice instrument in 1980 by the Roland Corporation, and was a flop in part because it was thought that the, the drum rhythms themselves didn't closely resemble that of an actual drum set, or they were seen as sort of cheap imitations. But the rhythm composer, the 808, became really phenomenal and sort of a bedrock drum machine that was used in a lot of different styles, including hip hop in New York in the 80s. And of course, one of the other most revolutionary pieces of hip hop was rap, was this new form of vocalization that becomes really, really prominent and important in hip hop music. And here I'll play an example of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. This is also considered, um, the song The Message, is also considered sort of one of these bedrock examples of early hip hop. And what's fascinating about this song is that it uses some of the same verses from a song that was released by the same group in 1979 in Super Rappin, and then just recontextualizes it in this new format. So I'll play the 1979 one here. And this is an epic song. It's maybe almost 10 minutes long, and, or actually over 10 minutes. And this particular verse comes in at almost 10 minutes. Get up out the seat, then you shake your butt. You say one, two, one more, and three, and melly mel. Come on, now what you got for me? But you don't stop that body box. You say a child is wrong with no state of mind. It's blind to the ways of mankind. God is smiling on you, but it's smiling too. Because only God knows what you'll go through. You'll go in the ghetto in the second rate. 
your eyes will sing a song to be hey the place you play where you stay it looks like one great big alleyway you'll admire all the dumb book takers thug pimps and pushers at the big money maker shallow big i'll spend the 20s and 10 then you want to grow up to be just like them and here's the message which is a really big song that came out in 1982 from the same group It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. A child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. God is smiling on you, but he's frowning too, because only God knows what you'll go through. You'll grow in the ghetto, living second rate, and your eyes will sing a song of deep hate. The places you play and where you stay looks like one great big alleyway. You'll admire all the number book takers, thugs, pimps, and pushers, and the big money makers. Driving big cars, spending the 20s and 10s, and you want to grow up to be just like them. Huh. Smugglers, scramblers, birds. Burglars, gamblers, pickpocket peddlers, even panhandlers. You say, I'm cool, I'm no fool. But then you wind up dropping out of high school. Now you're unemployed, all non-void. Walking around like your pretty boy Floyd. Turn stick up, kid, but look what you done did. Got sent up for an eight-year bid. Now your manhood is took and you're a make tag. Spend the next two years as an undercover. There were so many different aspects of hip-hop that are really revolutionary. And of course, rap was one of them. It crystallized this new vocal technique that was rooted in other older Black American traditions, such as the dozens, which were competitive forms of wordplay. It also in inventively placed a very rhythmic emphasis. It's very melodic at the same time, but very rhythmic emphasis over the sonic tapestries that were created by DJs. And it did so in order to boast, play, outdo, create fantastical fantasies, and also deliver social crit critique. And rap itself was, of course, incredibly referential, and in this case, self-referential. Black music and literary scholars, such as Guy Ramsey, Sam Floyd, Henry Louis Gates, have noted that rap and hip hop more broadly draw widely on signifying, which is a Black US American verbal technique in which speakers toy with and redeploy words, reveling in their connotations beyond literal meanings and reinventing them anew as play or bar. There's a quote from Trisha Rose that I really love. And Trisha Rose released a book in 1994 that's still seen as really the seminal work in hip hop studies. It's called Black Noise, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America. And Trisha Rose says, for rap's language wizards, all images, sounds, ideas, and the icons are ripe for recontextualization, pun, mockery, and celebration. And I think that we can definitely think about this in terms of the visuality of Basquiat's art itself. Basquiat's art draws upon the visual tropes of graffiti and also the rhetorical tropes of emceeing or rapping. It sutures text to image. A form of signifying itself, Basquiat's words find generative force in also extending this distance between the literal and the figurative, intended meaning and connotation, text and subtext, and the literal meaning of a word and its darker resonances. One example that's currently showing at the Nevada Museum of Art, the exhibit, The World Stage, Portfolio 2, Rome Pays Off, from 1984, offers a good example of this. The painting juxtaposes words, phrases, and images in Basquiat's trademark style, offering a testament to the living presences of history's colonialism. It also offers a biting critique of global economic exploitation. The word graft, which is up in the left-hand corner, indexes corruption and the unethical use of political gain for, or political power for personal gain. And it stands alongside phrases referencing global capitalism, Wall Street, and the stock exchange, such as estimated value or market value, which is circled and crossed out at the top. In the bottom left corner, the phrase Rome pays off conjures the decadence and decay of ancient empire, rendered with a registered trademark symbol. It's painted as a black and white inverted counterpoint to the figure of a crowned black skull on the right. Above it, the circled word image salt, a raw material exploited in colonial histories of trade, and a crown hover above the skull. The painting conjures resonances of the transatlantic African slave trade, linking them with contemporary and ancient empire global economics, and political corruption. Trisha Rose speaks of what she calls a hidden transcript of rap 
and hip hop in ways that I think intersect with Basquiat's Basquiat subversive and biting critiques. She says, quote, rap music is in many ways a hidden transcript. Among other things, it uses cloaked speech and disguised cultural codes to comment on and challenge aspects of current power inequalities. Not all rap transcripts directly critique all forms of domination. Nonetheless, a large and significant element in rap's discursive territory is engaged in symbolic and ideological warfare with institutions and groups that symbolically, ideologically, and materially oppress African Americans. Like graffiti, DJing, and rapping in hip hop, Basquiat recycles, copies, pastes, and scratches out words and images to enact this critique. The word images are visually stuttered, a uh, phrase that Franklin Sherman uses that I really like, and repeated in lists. Phrases and themes are reworked and recurring in thematically similar pieces, such as the Undiscovered Genius series. This painting just supposes symbols of freedom, like the Statue of Liberty, with those of enslavement enslavement, like the slave ship, which is also trademarked. It embeds scratched and repeated word images that index raw materials, tools of labor, and blues traditions from Africa, such as the word griot, and also the South, the Mississippi and the use of notes, which sort of sound um, a sort of blues note. The DJing techniques uh, in, of reuse and recontextualization in hip hop drew upon a longer tradition of signifying gestures in black music making of the 20th century in the US, especially jazz. Hip hop like jazz before it recontextualized the old to create the new. Basquiat often says that bebop was one of his favorite musical styles and a lot of his art paid homage to his male jazz heroes in paint such as bebop legends, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Bebop and hip hop have similarities in the ways in which they both draw upon the past to create new musical forms. Hip hop artists of the 70s and 80s often sampled disco and soul and funk art artists from the 60s. And jazz musicians in the 1940s, including Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, would often repurpose familiar chord changes of Tin Pan Alley hits, such as I've Got Rhythm, to make songs that I think to listeners who are not really super versed in jazz probably sound incredibly different from each other, but which actually use the same chord changes in ways that would certainly be recognizable to jazz players. This painting, which is called Portfolio II, Charles I, is interpreted as a homage to Charlie Parker, one of Basquiat's heroes. The crown hangs over the word Thor, referencing the Norse god of storms and strength, and the bottom reads darkly, and is scratched, most young kings get their head cut off. This potentially references the difficulties of Parker's young life and his premature death at the age of 34. We also witnessed the reappearance of Basquiat's trademark crown. While many have read the crown as a celebratory and revisionist elevation of male black heroes, the feminist author and social activist, Bell Hooks, offers a divergent take on the prominence of the crown. She says, the image of the crown, a recurring symbol in his work, calls to and mocks the Western obsession with being on top, the ruler. It indicates Basquiat's mocking, bitter critique of his own longing for fame. She also says, fame, symbolized by the crown, is offered as the only possible path to subjectivity for the black male artist. To be unfamous is to be rendered invisible. Like the use of royal and nobility referencing hip hop monikers in the 1980s, for example, Queen Latifah, Sir Mix-a-Lot, and King's Son, Basquiat's crowns also darkly aggrandize and then satirically critique the links between blackness, fame, and value. One of my personal favorite pieces is Now's the Time, this was done in 1985 and is a reference to the same song um, of the same name that was made by Charlie Parker in 1945. This is a, a recognizable song that I think many of you will know. I'll play it here.
this piece is it, it offers a sort of visual sample of the song itself. It also gives a sense of urgency, almost a sense of political urgency, now's the time, but it also plays with the notion of time and the temporal nature of music itself. We can think of phrases like keeping time or in time that are often used in jazz and in music more broadly. It's also trademarked, um, you know, referencing the commercialization of black artists such as Parker and linking black male creativity to exploitation and fame. So I've gone through a lot of the ways in which Basquiat's art, the visual art itself, interfaces with the techniques that are used in emergent hip hop culture. But very much like hip hop culture itself, which was not only restricted to one domain, you know, hip hop has been coined sort of after the fact as something that encompasses a lot of different elements. The musical side, which is DJing and rapping, the artistic side, which is street art and graffiti, and then breakdancing or b-boying, the sort of uh, bodily embodied side of, of hip hop culture as well. And there's a really great quote from Michael Holman in the movie Radiant Child that's about John Michel Basquiat, where he talks about how in the late 1970s and early 1980s, people didn't generally think of themselves as restricted to one domain. You know, people would be graffiti writers, they would be actors, they would be musicians, they would be in a band, they would be working on films, etc. There are a lot of different ways in which people were creative more broadly within this larger culture and not just in the sense of music versus graffiti um, versus other forms of art. And Basquiat was very much sort of emblematic of this cross media participation within these spaces in the late 70s. He spent a lot of time at the punk scenes and punk clubs he was in an experimental noise band called Gray, and then he also participated in hip hop directly as well. I'll play a, a song here that is from the experimental noise band that Basquiat was in called Gray in the late 1970s. And a lot has been said about this. Um, Basquiat was not a musician, but I think people who saw him play were like, oh man, he's the, he's the most incredible musician because he just, He's super experimental and he just sort of goes for it. And he played a lot of dis different instruments in these bands, some percussion, clarinet, guitar, et cetera. There are no actual recordings of Gray from the 1970s, but there was an album released in the, in the 2010s where the surviving members um, put together some, some tracks and they included some of the music that was recorded in odd spaces by Basquiat himself, as well as Basquiat's sort of voice. I'll play one of these here, and again, this is a recording that was actually released much, much later, but can give uh, an idea of the sort of experimentalism that was happening in this punk scene that also used avant-garde jazz techniques in the late 70s and early 80s. This is the song Pillar of Salt by Gray. <laughs> And then Jean-Michel Basquiat's most direct foray into hip hop production happens in 1983 with Beat Bob. And we'll re-listen re to this. This has also been considered a really monumental song in early hip hop. It was really long and very experimental in its use of filters and its kind of experimental use of 
things like reverb on the voice. So I'll start at about a minute and 20 seconds in when Basquiat's close friend, Ramel Z, who was also a graffiti writer and rapper, comes in with the second verse. Waiting in the house for Mr. Right. Kids going to school just to be your fool. Never want to learn to work just to go to a beat. And it's the funky beat. And it's the funky beat. And it's the funk, the funk. And it's the funky beat. Yeah. This is the mellow they call the rail well. The rock so with the rhythm that a shock can spell. When the shake up kick to wake you up in the morning. Gotta rate with the rhythm like a number one going. MC quick just to make you be the butter. Shock with the Number one on the cover. Bring it up, just shake it up, rodeo. Bring it up, just shake it up, rodeo. I'm the melody down with the funky sound that can make you break with my diamonds to the crown. Just for making you dip like a little bit of dive, like a ride. Just for making you high, rock on until the break of dawn. Just freak out, yeah, baby. Just freak out, yeah, baby. Like a little jelly bean, I'm a sweet like a candy cane to make you get down. This is number one stage. Ain't on the train, just moving like a stage what, jaw, just what? bring it up, yeah, yeah. Stage jaw, like a roller coaster ride, that can make you bump. This single has been described as both hip hop's artiest and rootsiest record. And you can hear really sort of wildly experimental ways in which there's a lot of reverb put on Ramelzi's voice. It makes it sound, and reverb is just this technique that changes the space of the room. So it sort of makes it sound like you're in this massive echo chamber, but then it cuts out mid verse to where it's really straight delivery of the voice. And this was seen as being a song that influenced later hip hop groups like Cypress Hill and also the Beastie Boys. So talking a little bit about hip hop legacy and Basquiat's legacy more broadly. Returning to this painting that I, that I showed earlier, if we sort of jump forward to Basquiat's legacy today, I think it's really incredible that he, he continues to resonate so strongly with um, so many different people and on so many different levels. Um, you know, Bell Hooks talks about the importance of the ways in which Basquiat's art makes, makes people feel and how we sort of feel when we encounter his visual work. And really, in terms of value, Basquiat's art is becoming practically priceless. Uh, three years ago, his painting from 1982 sold for $110.5 million, which is the highest price ever for a painting by an American artist or any piece of art created after 1980. So really, really astonishing. And then in terms of legacies within hip hop itself, the artist who's probably most famous for being a super fan of Basquiat, for collecting his artwork and for referencing it a lot in his music is Jay-Z. Songs like, um, here I'll play, I'll play one of them here. Songs like Picasso Baby, and I'll play this about a minute in, reference Basquiat really directly. I just want to blow up Condos and my condos I want to row up Chris Lee's with my Missy Live at the MoMA Bacon's and turkey bacon Smell the aroma Oh, what a feeling Cop those things Cop those things Cop, cop, cop those things Cop, cop, cop those things Oh, what a feeling Cop those things Cop, cop, cop those things Hard to tell. I'm the new Jean Michel. Surrounded by wall halls, my whole team ball. Twin Bugattis outside the Art Basel. I just want to live life colossal. Leonardo da Vinci flows. Ricardo Tisci Givenchy clothes. A lesser known contemporary artist that I find really fascinating is Revelation 1318. And what I love about this artist is that he takes, or he sort of riffs off of the techniques that Basquiat used in visual art, not only in terms of sound itself, which I think he does in really creative ways, but also in terms of the art. He almost takes Basquiat's techniques 
of editing and relayering and taking something from the past and repurposing it. And the album art for his albums are based on Basquiat paintings. They, of, of course, sort of shift them and add imagery and words to them. This one on the left, which came out in 2014, the album Now's the Time, of course, redeploys this Basquiat painting from 85 that itself riffs off of Charlie Parker. And Revelation 1318 adds, in addition to Now's the Time, this calls for wisdom. That's, that's scratched in a way that almost, if you sort of glanced at it and weren't, weren't paying a whole lot of attention, is very much in the style of Basquiat himself. I'll play a track from this 2014 album called Soul Food. <laughs> Just this year, 1318 also released an album called Undiscovered Genius that riffs off the Undiscovered Genius painting. And if you look at the, the album art again, it is the same painting, but it, it adds imagery. It sort of adds these text images that Basquiat was really famous for. For example, he actually puts his name, Revelation 1318. In the bottom, there's a lot of red writing, such as knowledge of self, gods and earths, education and 120 degrees that's in the slave ship emblem up at the left and so i think what's really interesting about revelation 1318 is not only the way that he sort of riffs upon and extends these logics that we see in basquiat's work but he also does this sonically in this song i'm about to play when i when i first heard this it reminded me of the sermons the way that Franklin Sermons describes this sort of visual stuttering of words that occurs in the paintings of Basquiat. And to me, there's a sort of stuttering of the rhythm that's really beautiful and creates this, um, this sort of really intense feel, but that is kind of purposefully stuttered in terms of the drums, especially. This is the song Reminisce from Undiscovered Genius. <laughs> I also just want to recognize a lot of these um, scholars. There's really great work that's been written on Basquiat that also touches upon these same themes. Um, Bell Hook's article, also Franklin Sermon's article. So I'm happy to, you know, email me. There's also the Jean-Michel Basquiat estate has a really great reference list for um, articles and books on Basquiat as well as film references as well. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. Ruthie, thank you so much. That was that was amazing. Um, so I, that was there was so much to think about there, and um, I, thanks again for the references at the end because I think that one of the things that's really important to recognize about his working style and process was that he was surrounded by records and books and uh, just all sorts of material that was not uh, especially relevant to hip hop, but in many ways. Uh, he was he was mixing things in, in a visual sense as he was creating work, um, and you see that with all of the 
the text references, imagery, and, and everything else that you see in his work. Um, one of the questions that came in in a couple of different ways while you were giving your presentation, and again, I'd like to encourage everybody to submit your questions in the Q&A function, which is the two speech bubbles you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, and I know that a lot of people are always really fascinated by and, and interested in the, the way that he would either uh, circle or circle and cross out words. Um, and Salvatore and Sarah both asked, you know, if that was um, him doing a live revision or if that was pre-planned, uh, I'm going to use air quotes because Salvatore used real quotes, but edits in the work. Uh, and if you could, could speak to that as potentially a reference to the same way of, of sampling or remixing or repeating that you find uh, often in hip hop, sort of as you referenced with the Sugar Hill Gang and, and other tracks like that. Yeah, I think one of the things that inspires me the most about Basquiat is his process. And of course, it's an open, it's an open question. Wow. I, um, he may have, you know, had, had different approaches at different times. But one of the uh, quotes that I've seen a lot in reference to the scratches, the scratches to the words, is that he said that he actually did this to call attention. Quotes that actually sort of reference this, that come from Basquiat himself, were like, I, I scratched these out to sort of call attention to them. Um, in terms of the pre-planning, as far as, you know, watching imagery of him, like, like in films, the film Radiant Child is really fantastic and sort of has these, these different moments where Basquiat is painting and then he, he'll paint something and it's actually really fantastic and, and calling and then he just paints over it really quickly and you're almost like, oh, um, but that, that, was, that was definitely part of his process in ways that I think are really fascinating, this sort of editing process. I can certainly make parallels with with music making, I think it's it's experimental. I would think that um, just from you know what I've seen of Basquiat, at least that he was very into editing and re-editing and things that are or in ways that are very parallel with hip hop. There was there was an interview with him about his collaborations with Andy Warhol, where he said that Andy Warhol would come in and he'd have a vision, and he'd do it once, and that would sort of that would be it. And that what Basquiat pushed him to do was to have him do something and then Basquiat would come in and, and go over it in ways that were maybe even um, occasionally upsetting to Warhol. And then he would force him to paint again and then he would go over that and sort of re-edit it. So my impression is that he, he did a lot of on the spot experimental editing as far as sort of layering and crossing words out or leaving them in, in ways that I think definitely are very parallel to the ways that people edit and experiment when they're, when they're doing music production and hip hop. Yeah, and I think, um, I think that that's really telling when you think about, and this leads into our next question from um, Britain, which is, you know, that he, the way that we listen to music often is to listen to it and you receive one sort of, you have your initial impression, you listen to it again, or you revisit it after a couple of years, and you have a whole new sort of impression of the of the of the music itself and uh, what it means to you and how it's recontextualized based on what's going on in the world uh, around you and thankfully Jean-Michel was able to leave us with this you know body of work that when you look at it now becomes just as relevant as it was then when you think about the Black Lives Matter movement um, I can only imagine that he would be um, you know very outspoken and, and involved with you know what's going on in this moment. Um, and Britton asks, do you think that the way that Basquiat's audience understands his work has changed over time? For instance, do you think that modern artists such as Jay-Z are receiving the same messages from Basquiat's work as his contemporaries at that time? That's a really, that's a really fascinating question. It kind of makes me think, I don't know if this is who, who this is attributed to, but I've heard this before that you never heard, you never hear the same song twice. Right. And you, you, you know, even if it's the same recording, it never, it never enters your consciousness. You're not the same person when, whenever you see something or hear it um, again. So I think that, I think there's two ways to look at this. I think that, I think that a lot of his, the sort of resonances that his art had in the eighties are still just as powerful today because um, in a lot of ways, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of the critiques that he was making in the eighties are still completely powerful today. So I think there's a lot of resonance between 
critiques he's making of racism in the United States and colonial histories, et cetera, and their living presence that are felt today as deeply as they were in the 1980s. Um, the question about how his life has changed, I mean, he did die so young and he only had a decade's worth of work. And I think that that combination in terms of the value of his art itself certainly is based on sort of this, this American obsession with rarity. Um, you know, the, I think that it would be interesting to think of the ways in which, you know, how would he be received if he, if he had, had lived on and what, what would he have done? And these are, of course, unanswerable kind of open questions. But yeah, I think, I think his work is so powerful today precisely because the themes that he brings up and the ways that it resonates with people um, are so powerful still. I, I do think that the ways in which um, he was framed in the art world in the 80s, I, I actually can't really speak to this because I'm not, I'm not in the art world, but I think the ways that he was, you know, kind of caricatured in the 80s when he emerged, um, hopefully that has, has changed in terms of art criticism of him. Um, but yeah, I think, again, that a lot of these, a lot of these issues that his life brings up and that his art bring up really, really resonate really powerfully right now. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, in thinking about the art world, I think it's really interesting. And I made a note about trademarks earlier in your, in your presentation, and how in some ways, he saw the writing on the wall, that sort of characterization of himself uh, at that point by the art world. And sort of being lifted up and he had a very short life but was really pushed and pushed himself to be incredibly prolific and now you see everything from uniqlo lines of basquiat's work uh you can buy doc martens with basquiat on them um the band the strokes uh their last album features a basquiat work um there and you know he sort of uh i think very deftly saw that coming um and i i don't know how that would have been that much different. Maybe he would have had a little bit more control over where it goes if he, I don't know if he would have wanted to end up on fast fashion or maybe that's exactly where he would want to end up um, in thinking about that. I do think it's it's really interesting to see people such as Jay-Z um, uh, sort of revisit his work as a place of empowerment um, in, in recontextualizing the message. If there was a message, I think he was, um, he was just making work and, and not thinking uh, like I want to create a tome that that is uh, laid out um, for generations to come. Um, how and and maybe you can speak some to um, the the state of hip hop as it is now. Um, in in this may be a, a big question, but you know how do you how do you see him having laid the groundwork for what we're seeing right now? between um, some of these brand uh, affiliations, collaborations across genres, uh, and especially the emergence of, of social media and the interplay between hip hop graffiti writers and, um, and well, now they're rap artists, not as much just DJs or MCs and DJs have spun off and become their own thing. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a, that's a huge question. I think that, <laughs> I think I think one thing that's that's interesting about early hip hop and about um, Basquiat's involvement in it, and that I I tried to touch on this in the talk, but that it's it's really like this 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 culture that had a lot of different elements that exploded, and of course it's not exactly the same in terms of um, Basquiat's career and hip hop itself, but it really has you know been sort of massively influential and it's transformed. Um, Basquiat left this incredible body of work that also transforms in balance, but that stops at 88 when he, when he dies. Whereas, you know, hip hop has become, hip hop is not US music anymore. You know, it's hip hop is, is truly global. There's, there's lots of different hip hop um, music cultures that, you know, in Tokyo or Havana or, or all of these um, different places. And hip hop has become this massive commercial, you know, multi-billion dollar yearly industry in so many ways that kind of parallel um, Basquiat's, you know, the value at least of his work today. So again, I, I think that this is a, it's sort of a huge, a huge question. There's been a lot of changes in terms of the way that hip hop is made based on copyright. You know, like in the early 80s, just talking about music, 
it was a lot easier to use infinite samples and to not have to sort of go through these really expensive payment processes. And that's something that shifts in the early 90s. Um, so definitely hip hop, making hip hop is a bit more complicated in terms of that originary sampling that was happening in the late 70s and 80s. I think people have to get really creative about using open source sounds or having a record label who can foot the bill for, for actually paying these kind of massive, massive royalties. So I'm not sure if that gets to like a little slice of the question. Sure. Well, and it's interesting because you see that happening more and more in the art world when you think of appropriation, you think of artists such as Richard Prince who are then um, pursued legally for using somebody else's imagery. Um, and you think of artists such as Cause who you know, openly collaborates with major brands such as the Snoopy's line or, um, you know, whatever it may be and is producing Jordans and things like that with, with that imagery on it. Um, and, you know, thankfully Basquiat lived at a time and hip hop was born at a time when people wouldn't chase you down for royalties because you sampled and were able to use their imagery uh, in that way. And um, yeah, do we have, I'm gonna see if we have any more questions here uh, coming in from the audience and, you know, again, um, one thing that I'm definitely seeing and I know I would love it and, uh, and who knows if we'll be able to make this happen, but everybody wants to hear a playlist from you. Oh yeah. You um, know what? Let me actually put it in the chat, in the chat right now. The, right. um, the playlist that I used for this talk. Here we go. And just, you know, a few quick Google searches will send you down a rabbit hole of fantastic music, uh, starting with bebop and, and moving all the way through the contemporary when you look at Jean-Michel Basquiat and how his work has touched sort of the entire field of um, music, uh, not just hip hop. When, you know, I mentioned that, you know, bands like The Strokes are using his, ref his album as a, his work as an album cover. And you think about The Offs, which is more of a ska band uh, that he did a record cover for as well. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions coming in, um, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you very much, Dr. Ruthie Meadows. This was fantastic. Um, I, you know, I, I could spend all day thinking about this, and I'm going to go home and, and listen to some records. Um, and I think that that feels like the appropriate thing to do. Again, I'd like to thank the uh, Nevada Humanities and the Core Humanities Program at University of Nevada, Reno for sponsoring this program today and making this possible, as well as the Jordan D. Schnitzer Family Foundation for lending work to the world stage, contemporary art from the Jordan D. Schnitzer and Family Foundation collection. So you can see four works by um, Basquiat uh, on view currently at the Nevada Museum of Art through early February. I'd highly encourage you to come and check out that work um, Basquiat's work is amazing in the show, but you'll also see contemporaries of his, such as uh, Andy Warhol, as well as a number of other amazing artists. I know I referenced it in the chat, but um, Charles I, the first, the artwork that was featured in Dr. Meadows' talk, and we that came up a couple of times, is in the exhibition, also inspired a 2010 Jay-Z track called Most Kings. So definitely come and check it out. Dr. Meadows, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you all. That was today. fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you on September 25th for an Art Bite with artist Mildred Howard, who's also in the World Stage Exhibition. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and email me. I think most everybody here has my email. And uh, thanks again. All right. Thank you. Bye.